I want to talk to you about um, the importance of obeying God's word. Now, yeah, we know that, Pastor Terso. But even the best of us sometimes procrastinate or delay. And then we forfeit the blessing that God has for us. Um, how important God's word is. The, the Archbishop of, uh, of the New York Diocese, uh, Cardinal Dolan, he said this, we must know the word of God in order to know the God of the word. In order to know the God of the word, you must know the word of God. So important. And uh, I, I came across this and I just thought it would be um, maybe some faith facts that might help us. Do you know that there are 66 Bibles, 66 letters of books in the Bible? And it was written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years in perfect harmony. And the very first book that was ever printed on the printing press, printing press that was uh, invented by Jonathan Gutberg uh, was the Bible. In fact, at this point now, there are over 600 languages, a thousand dialects, and it's still the best seller in the world. That's encouraging to me. Because when I think of all the Bible bashing that's going on and people snickering at the fact that you really read your Bible and you really carry it with you or it's on your phone, yeah, I'm proud of it because it's outlived. Remember, Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will last forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs> Luke 5, verses 1 to 11, but I'm going to be reading it from the new century. We'll have it on the screens. It says, one day while Jesus was standing beside Lake Galilee, Many people were pressing all around him to hear the word of God. Jesus saw two boats at the shore of the lake, and that fisherman had left them and were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, and asked him to push off a little from the land. And then Jesus sat down and continued to teach the people from the boat. Or, excuse me, speak from the boat. Yes, verse 4. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, take the boat into deep water and put your nets in the water to catch some fish. Simon asked, Master, we worked hard all night trying to catch fish, and we caught nothing. But you say to put the nets in the water, so I will. When the fishermen did as Jesus told them, they caught so many fish that the nets began to break. They called to their partners in the other boat to come and help. They came and filled both boats so full that they were almost begin to sink. When Simon Peter saw what had happened, he bowed down before Jesus and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He and the other fishermen were amazed at the many fish they caught, as were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee Simon's partner. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And when the men brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. It begins with verse 1 saying one day. And we shouldn't be surprised that God may do something miraculous one day. Because to him, every day is the same. In fact, this is the day he has made, so we rejoice. And every day is the day he has made. And there's, there can be a, a huge difference. What a day, a, a difference can be made in a day. And I want you to realize, don't just take this for granted. They were working. It was a work day. God may want to use you in the, in the office or maybe just uh, preparing lunch or whatever it might be, going to school. It's just Jesus. One day he was at the lake. And, and Jesus is standing by the lake, and a crowd gathers to hear the word of God. Like today, you all gather to hear the word of God. And he uses a very uh, objective lesson uh, with fish and catching because he was in a fishing town and he was going to reach out to these fishermen, which made sense. In fact, in the beginning of his ministry, Luke 5, verses 1 to 11, he talks about fish. And after his ministry, after the resurrection, in John 21, verses 1 to 11, again, he uses fish as an object lesson. And this occasion now was the second time Jesus called the disciples. The first time was in Matthew 4 and Mark 1 when he called them. And they went with Jesus on a little ministry tour, but they went back to fishing again with their, with their boats and nets. But now they didn't go back. And Jesus saw the two boats there, and uh, they're cleaning their nets. And uh, he walks over to them to want to ask Peter to have his, his boat. And I don't believe it was coincidental. I don't think it was accidental. I think Jesus intentionally to use Peter. because Peter was the link between Andrew and James and John and the rest that were going to come along. It wasn't cool. It was definitely intentional. And Jesus asked Simon to push off a little. I think that's significant because that's how God works with us. Little. Little at a time. He doesn't give us more than we can handle. 
And so he told Peter, just, just push off a little. That's how God works. And he, he did that so that in the boat, he's sitting in the boat, the people are on shore, which is on an incline. Uh, the water sounds like a, a sound system. It reverberates his voice. And plus, he's able to see them and have a line of sight, the people to him and him to the people. So he's very strategic in doing this. Um, and uh, God will use your boat, whatever your boat is, as a pulpit. Most people don't get to stand up here. That's because you're called to be up here. But it doesn't mean that you don't have a boat to speak from. You have a job where you can speak. You'll be in the salon or the barbershop or wherever it might be. And that's your boat to preach. That's your boat to speak to people about Jesus. In fact, it could be a hospital or a rehab. I spent a month in the hospital all of January, and I promise I will not continue to give you hospital uh, uh, illustrations with the sermon. I won't do that. But this one, my surgeon's name was Hartman. And he was a heart surgeon. Think about that. I mean, the only better name after Hartman is Jesus. I mean, come on. And he asked me, what, what did I do? And I told him, and he said, it was interesting. You know, he was a very kind man. He was a very good man. And uh, before the operation, my wife prayed, prayed on him and prayed for him. And then after the operation, he, one of his visits to me he came every day. He says, you know, you remind me of somebody, somebody that I, I had a while ago that seems to be the same spirit. And I found out it was Pastor Bowman. Dan Bowman from Queens Tabernacle. He had the same doctor. And so both of us had an opportunity to share. Now, he didn't bend his knee and call on Jesus, but some plant, some sow, some water, some plant, God makes it grow, right? So, you know, whatever, whatever you find yourself, that boat becomes your pulpit. Verse 4, and when Jesus finished speaking, he asked Simon to take the boat into the deep waters. Verse 3, it was a little. Verse 4, now it's deep. He's bringing him along. He's bringing all of us along. I, my dear brother and sister, you should not be the same as you were last year. There's growth. There has to be growth. And wherever you see growth, there's life. And so he's, he's bringing them along, and Jesus is just, I mean, he's, he's the best. And he tells them, put your nets in the water to catch some fish. Um, but that's a problem with fishing strategy, because you don't fish during the day with nets in deep water. The fish can see it. You fish with nets at night, but not during the day. And so this was, this was going to be a problem uh, for Peter and his team because I could imagine Peter thinking, oh, okay, you know, Jesus, you're a carpenter's son, and uh, you probably can make some nice cabinets and hang a door. Um, and you're a great teacher, a great teacher. But when it comes to fishing, I know fishing. I'm a fisherman. I know this lake like the back of my hand. I've been doing this all my life, so I don't really think that you're the one that should be making the judgment call on how to fish or where to fish. Because Jesus, Simon explains to me, yes, you don't do this during the day in deep water with nets. Um, in fact, I could see him saying, you know what, Jesus, you want to buy a boat? I got one right here. You can take my boat because it didn't work for us. And what's epic, epic is verse 5. It says, but if you say so, Peter talking to Jesus. But if you say so, so I will. But if you say so, so I will. I don't think it's going to work. Uh, this just contradicts anything I've learned all my years from fishing. We're tired. We worked all night. We're drying our nets. We want to go home. We want to go to sleep. But if you say so, well, I'll do it. I think that was huge. Do you know if you want to be fruitful in your Christian walk, you need to be obedient to God, to God's word, whether you're reading God's word or the Holy Spirit's uh, nudging you on something or you hear a sermon, you need to, be, that's how you have fruitful ministry. That's how you have a fruitful Christian walk. That's how you go further. There's an old hymn, in fact, it was made 1886. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. None of you are repeating it after me. You don't know it. Am I that old? You're that young? Trust in Jesus, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. A young man was in a D.L. Moody meeting, and after D.L. Moody spoke, he went up to D.L. Moody and says, I don't know if I can trust, and I don't know if I could obey. And D.L. Moody told his worship leader what this young man said, and the worship leader went back to the piano, and he wrote this song on the spot, and we've been singing it over 100 years. Why? Because it's significant. Trust and obey, for there is no other way. And isn't it true, I'm, I, well, I'll speak for myself. When I'm tired, when I'm hungry, when I failed, I don't want to do another thing. 
it's our human nature. And uh, it's possible that, you know, uh, Peter didn't want to do another thing after working hard and going deeper. And, and besides, in front of the crowd, right? This whole crowd on the beach. This is a fishing village. They're looking at him saying, uh, duh, you don't go deep with nets during the day. So that probably was a little struggle he had. Um, but he did. Even though he knew it was contrary to what you do, or that's common sense, he did what, what God asked him to. And um, a little bit of a challenge. I mean, ask ourselves how many times Jesus tells us to do something out of the ordinary, maybe what's not common, um, and we delay, we procrastinate. You know, delay obedience is disobedience. You've heard that before. And um, I I've delayed. You know, God tells you to get up and read your devotional tonight, but you're tired, you worked hard. God, you understand. He does. You're not going to lose your salvation, but you're probably going to miss out on a blessing. Or when he tells you to text someone, but God, the phone is in the kitchen and I'm on the fourth floor. <laughs> and we have all kinds of excuses, great excuses. But when God gives us a nudge, you know, remember young Samuel when he was a boy? Speak, Lord, your servant listens. That should be our answer when he gives us that nudge, when he tells us to do something, when he tells us to read our Bible, when he tells us to pray for someone, when he tells us to text someone. Oh, but they might be sleeping. All right, they'll get it in the morning. But you don't know what that person's going to. God knows everything. He knows everything about us, and he knows the struggles we're having. And, and I barely ask God to help me. When you give me those nudges, God, I want to respond. I want to do I don't care what time it is. If you're telling me to do this, then you must understand this is the right time. You know, when God told you to bless someone, when God told you to, to, to invite someone to the men's meeting, oh, but I did, and they said no 10 other times. Okay, well, this might be the time they'll say yes. You never know because people are in different seasons. You know, when God tells you to pray for someone or to start something or to stop something, when he tells you to say you're sorry, ooh, when he tells you to forgive someone, when he tells you to give like uh, Swana was telling us a moment ago with our tithe or to, to get involved in ministry at the ministry uh, expo, he has a commitment. What happens here is a result of committed people. The lights, the sound, the singing, the preaching, the teaching, the hearing impaired for the deaf, it's, it's all because there's committed people. And so we need everybody to commit. If this, you're calling this church your, your home, well, then we need to all roll up our sleeves and be involved. Uh, and I want to encourage you with that. And maybe we're reluctant. Maybe we are reluctant in obeying because of maybe what family might say. You're going to church again? You're going to do what? How much are you going to give? Or maybe it's friends, you know, they... They're your friends, you know, you love them, but um, they don't share the same relationship with Christ. And they don't share the same importance you have on serving the Lord or reading scriptures or praying. And if you're not careful, they can take you down. You know, that, that, there's that old illustration of someone standing here and you want to pull them up, but it would be easier for them to pull you off. And so you want to even know who your friends are so that, you know, you don't let them, you want to influence them. You don't want them to influence you. And I, I know you know this, but you don't want uh, Instagram or TikTok or social media or culture to ever influence us that's, that has something contrary to God's word. I'm not condemning all of that. I'm just saying don't ever let it influence you. You need, you need to stand on God's word. Um, and uh, you never want to argue, right? Second Timothy says you don't want to argue. You stay away from foolish arguments but you want to stand strong in your belief and in your convictions. You know, there are Christian ministries that are being attacked by the government. I love our government. Pray for our government. But they're attacking it for all kinds of reasons because there's some people that say they believe, but their actions seem to say otherwise. You know, the Bible is being considered a book of hate speech. Um, people are saying that, uh, you know, you, you really believe there's only two genders? You know, Google says there's a 100. Well, Google did not die on a cross for me. The one who died on the cross for me, I'm going to believe him. You know, the fact that marriage is between a man and a woman, oh, don't be so narrow-minded. No, I'm being Bible-minded. It's not, it's not trendy to say that, but it's true. <laughs> Jeremiah, first chapter, before I formed you, before I knew you. So don't tell me that baby in the womb is just a bunch of cells. It's a baby. It's a person. And that's why we can't, and, and, and it seems like all the things that are contrary to the word of God are so popular. 
They're in songs and in celebrities and athletes. And, but, but you need to be able to say, not me. Not me. Give me Jesus. Let that not be a song that we just sing on Sunday. But give me Jesus. We as Christians, we as Christians, we should believe it's better to uh, obey God's word than any public opinion or anything like that. And never to go against the word of God. And uh, even though this was contrary to good fishing practices, Simon was rewarded for his efforts because he dared to believe. Because you say so, I will. I love that. I mean, he was, us to be successful Christians, and I mean that in our walk with God, growing as mature men and women of God for the calling that God has in our lives, it's, we need to obey. We need to obey God's word and, and, and go deep, as, as the scriptures tells us. Verse 6 and 7 tells us, as soon as Simon obeyed, there was success. As soon as he obeyed, as soon as he went from little to deep, pushed that boat out of it, threw those nets in that must have been heavy because they were still, still wet from the day before, threw them over the side in the middle of the day, probably feeling like a jerk, listening to this itinerant teacher who's just a carpenter's son. So much success. He had to call his partners, guys, James and John, come over here, you have to help us. Those boats, they say, were estimated around 20 to 30 feet. So they would be as long as a two to three story building. And they were primarily flat. So when they put, brought the nets on, on the deck, they could lay out the fish and then they would sort them out when they get to shore. So they had to call their friends to help them because there were so many fish. And it says, the Bible says, that the boats, both boats began to sink. Because the, the weight of the fish was so heavy, it was pulling them down. And I think, you know what? The people on the shore that, pe that Peter or Simon might have been worried about, they're probably waving their hands saying, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. You're going to give me some of that fish? It was a great day for obedience, for obedience. God always wants to save the day. Remember the wedding feast of Cana in John 2? They ran out of wine. The only things they had to drink was water and wine, and their water was hard. It wasn't very taste tasteful. And so Mary knew that her son, even though she didn't have a full comprehension of who he was, she went to the, to the staff and says, John 2, 5, do whatever he tells you to do. It's powerful. I've been praying, God, I want to do whatever you tell me, even when it doesn't feel convenient, even when, it, even when I don't like it. I want to do whatever you tell me to do. Remember the blind man in John 9? He was sitting there and he wanted to get his sight. And Jesus says, well, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Really? You're telling a blind man to go somewhere? He can't see. But he obeyed. And because he obeyed, he got his sight. He went to the pool of Siloam. He washed his face and all of a sudden he could see. That's what happens with obedience. Well, after feeding the 5,000 or the 4,000, who would think you could feed that many people, thousands of people with a few loaves and fishes? Ridiculous. It's not going to happen. Common sense is it's not going to happen. But godly sense made it happen, right? In fact, not only were all the people filled and satisfied, they went home with doggy bags. They left with baskets full. Or when Jesus told two disciples to go find a donkey and, and tell the people the Lord needs it and they'll let you have their property. And it happened just as Jesus said, even though it doesn't make sense when you obey God. You know, whenever you close a teaching or a sermon, and any of you that do the small groups, whatever, you always want to make sure that closing remark really drives what you were teaching about home. Well, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he's closing his sermon. And he begins to tell the story about these two houses that are built, one on rock, one on sand. And that the rains are going to come. And the rains, and, and, and the one that's built on rock, the rains won't knock it down. But the one that's built on sand, it's going to collapse. And what was the difference? The difference was the person that built on the rock was a person that hears God's word, hears God's word, and puts it into practice. The person's house collapsed was someone who hears God's word, but doesn't put it in practice. In other words, today you're hearing God's word, and you may be nodding your head, and you may be saying amen. But if you don't put it into practice, it does you no good. It's not enough to say amen. It's not enough to, put, to, to, to nod your head yes. You have to put it into practice. And that's beginning with me. That's for all of us. We have to understand that. In fact, one day, you know, Jesus' mother and brother was, was outside of this house he's teaching. And they went to him and to give him a heads up and says, you know, Jesus, your mother and brother's here. And they probably thought he would say, all right, get her, get her in here. That's my mother. Get her in here. Don't mess with my mother. Get her in here right now. Bring my brothers in. He didn't do that. He said to the people that were there that were probably thinking that, he said in Luke 8, 21, my mother, my brothers, 
those, are hear God, those are who hear God's word and apply it. That's a strong statement. He wasn't disrespecting his mother. He was just trying to make everyone understand how important it is to obey God's word. Even when it comes to family. Even when it comes to family. Even when it comes to family. The eighth chapter, excuse me, the eighth chapter, the eighth verse is Revelation. Simon realizes he has witnessed the miracle. All these fish flopping around on the deck, can't pull the nets in. Uh, in the middle of the day, uh, in the deep water, he realizes, I, I just witnessed a miracle from the miracle worker. And he says to Jesus, go away from me, Lord. Not in a disrespectful way, but because I'm sinful. I, I'm not good enough for you to be in my presence. I, just, you, need, you need to leave. I need to leave. And I want you to know, you, you can never be good enough for Jesus. You can't earn his favor. He loves you unconditionally. I, said, I heard someone say, well, if you say that to people, they think they can keep on sinning because God loves them unconditionally. I didn't say that. The Bible said that. God loves us unconditionally with an unconditional love. And if someone thinks like that, well, that's their choice. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relish in the fact that he loves me in spite of what I do or what I don't do. And it's not, it doesn't give me a reason to exercise uh, disobeying God. I want to obey him more because of his love for me. Um, you know, we, we, we walk by faith. It's, we, it's through grace that we walk by faith, and faith is so important. In fact, four times. And faith, obviously, it's, it's what you, you really can't touch. It's not tangible. It's something that you just trust God with. And it's written four times. Four different books talk about living by faith, walking by faith. Habakkuk, Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, all telling us the same thing. If it was once, it would be enough. This is four times. Four times. Because without faith, you can't please God. And you know what I love about this story? And I don't think I'm stretching this. But Peter is obviously doubting. Launch out in the deep, really, Jesus? It's in the day. We cleaned up. And that's not going to work. But because you say so. Even though he was reluctant, the fact that he did it to me was an evidence of faith to obedience. Because sometimes all God asks for us, and oftentimes, just a small mustard seed of faith. And God will honor it. God honored his small mustard seed of faith. Do whatever he told you to do. Remember the Red Sea crossing with Pharaoh and the chariots coming at Moses and the million plus people in the Red Sea in front of them? And they were fearful and terrified to think they're going to be killed by, by the Egyptian soldiers. And in Exodus 14, 13, God tells Moses that there's no way out, but fear not and see the salvation of the Lord. That's what we do when we trust God. He's a saving God. Verse 9, let me bring this to a close. He and the other fishermen were amazed of the many fish that they caught as, 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 as James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's Peter. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. There was a from now on, a from now on. In other words, a change. Chris, could you help me? What a difference a day makes. Started out business as usual, cleaning the nets, hoping that his wife prepared some food when he gets home to eat. Then he's going to go to bed, get ready for the next night. All happened in one day. One day. Verse 11 says, and they left everything to follow Jesus. That's what I want to challenge us with today, that we'll leave whatever is not God to follow Jesus. And it could happen in a day. It could happen today. Bear me if you heard, heard this before, but bear with me. But there was a time, Rhea and I, 1975, we were living together. Uh, ungodly lives, vulgar, cursing, drugs, immorality. And we thought we were cool, going to the club all the time. And we were in a club med, and I don't recommend that you go to a club med. That's not a Christian vacation spot. <laughs> you go there when you want to do everything that's not godly. And we were there for two weeks, 10 days, really. And she got this sense that we got to go to church when we go back. And I thought that was ridiculous. I was raised Roman Catholic. I did 12 years of parochial school. I'm good. I'm good. I don't rob anyone. You know, I buy my drugs on Broom Street like everybody else. I pay my money for it. You know, I'm good. Uh, we're, we're, I'm not forcing you to have sex with me, right? It's consensual, right? We're not married, but hey, you know, love the one you're with. God understands. And so I didn't want to go to church. You know, I just thought it was not necessary. But I didn't want to fight with my, my girlfriend. 
So I said, all right, when we get back, we'll go. She promised, she said, promise we will go. I said, all right. So our friends, which unbeknownst us, they became Christians. They got saved. And they brought us to church. Don't ever underestimate you praying for someone and then bringing them to a church. And hear me, it doesn't have to be this church. It doesn't, you just find a good church to bring them to. Well, we went in, but I was so angry. I, I'm even embarrassed to tell you the clothes that I had on because we were going to go to the club. And I had drugs in my pocket and uh, just ready for a night out after we get rid of this thing. And I made fun of the pastor. I made fun of the worship. It wasn't like this worship. It was kind of really hokey to me. Uh, but the pastor got up at the very end and he made an appeal. It had to be God. Both me and I went up together and we gave our lives to Christ. In one day, in one day, it changed the trajectory of our lives for over 40 years. We never went back doing drugs. For any of you that are living together, if you love each other, get married. In fact, if you want to, we'll do it right after this service. We know it was wrong to live together. I moved back with my parents. I felt like an idiot. 25 years old, I'm going back to live with my parents, really? We did that, and then we got married a short time after. Threw away the clothes, the club clothes, the drugs, the music, everything. In one day. In one day, what a difference a day makes. That's what happened here. In one day, these men that were continuing with their fishing business all of a sudden realized nets and boats are not their life. Jesus is, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. There's a, I came across this, it could be a legend. I'm not sure. It's not in the Bible. But in 1519, the Spanish conquistador, Rene, I wrote the tongue, Renando. Hernando Cortez sailed a couple of ships to Mexico, which is amazing, from Spain to Mexico. And after the, the men got off the boat, the soldiers, most of the crew, he had some of his men go and light the boats on fire, destroy them, because he wanted to rule out any option of them getting on the boats and going back in case the goings got hard. They burned the boats. There's a time in our lives, brothers and sisters, we need to burn the boats. The friends that are not helping us, the drugs, the behavior, the conduct, the entertainment, the music. There's a point where you just need to burn the boats. You need to make Jesus your all in all and drop your net and drop your boat and now begin to live for him or whatever that may look like. You know, it may be an addiction. I know we prayed before about emotions. It might be just surrendering. But whatever it is, before you leave here, I'm hoping that you'll do that.